as Anne just said, I just published a book on this, uh, European Integration, a concise history. Uh, I confess to being, in many ways, a general historian and uh, a historian of historiography. I haven't done so much of the uh, uh, I haven't done so much of the excellent empirical work that my my hosts have. Uh, I'm also a critic of the stories. And in fact, this paper is basically a follow-up on the argument that underlines chapters 6 and 7 of my, of my book. And I hope uh, it takes it a little bit further. I don't know about any of the people here present, but I always finish something and then immediately start thinking, how could I improve that? And to a certain extent, this is the first attempt to do just that. Uh, most historians, proper historians if you like, um, diplomatic historians, archive-based historians are at the moment working on the 1970s, 60s and 1970s, for obvious reasons. The archives are there, they're working on archives, they're working on um, uh, detailed accounts of given moments in European integration history. Uh, on the other hand, if you're going to write a book like this, if you're going to write a general history, you uh, have to go beyond history. You have to deal with the present. You have to deal with current affairs. Uh, you have to deal with what scholars of politics have written. These may seem like very evident points, very self-evident points, but they're really not. Uh, and I think in the case of European integration history in particular, and I'll just now talk about European integration and history. Following on from uh, Keduri you know, and the Chatham House version, I think there is something of an EU studies version of the history of this period, of the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, it's a version that's been constructed by uh, the EU itself. It's a version that's been constructed by people working on the EU, uh, for reasons I'm going to go into later in the talk. Uh, and I suppose what I'm trying to do in this paper today, or what I shall do in this paper today, is look at some of the ways we're likely to revise this version of how the EC turned into the EU. And to be talking about possible histories, about things that um, about ways in which historians, as they have access to the archives in the future, as they involve themselves in a historical process which is um, still going on, are likely to revise the story that has been predominant in the textbooks and in, uh, as a basis for European, European studies. As I say, I thought I'd have a few slides. Uh, now here we have a very flattering portrayal of Mr. Delors. Uh, just to uh, just to break the monotony of me me talking for a minute. Um, why have I written Years of Stagnation, 1974 to 1984? I'm asking you this. Maybe you don't agree. Economic stagnation. Economic stagnation in what way? Well, you have an oil crisis. Mm -hmm. The process of European integration does it does it uh, is it are these sensationally good years for European integration or not? Not really. Somebody says at the back straight away. Tell me why. Uh, I don't think anything really. Uh, in the, the degree of integration increased or decreased, just to stay as it was in 1970. Exactly. Oh, okay, there's an answer to something we can Right, so the degree. <laughs> of... It is nice not to construct a straw man, yes. Uh, 
Mark, yes? you've got to get back here because you're being videoed. Oh, uh, right. Yes. So <laughs> you've got to come around because our video man will have a nervous breakdown. Okay, I, uh, my usual lecturing style is to, run, is to cover about as many his, kilometers as Reno the does in the talk again. I should make you sit down otherwise. <laughs> um, years of stagnation. The degree of integration doesn't really increase. Well, Britain enters, but... And what does Britain add to the European integration? Anyway? The silence is deafening. No, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you, I, because I want to, to underline a point. What does Britain add to the European community, according to the literature that everybody reads in the textbook? My friend over here. Please? Strong belief in free trade. Britain does indeed have a strong belief in free trade, yes. Um, the Dutch didn't feel alone for once. Uh, Britain adds, doesn't it? Certainly if you read standard accounts of what happens, what does Britain add? Yes, it adds uh, a, in some ways it's a poison chalice. Britain comes in the European community, what does it do? It immediately proceeds to argue about the small prints of its contribution and uh, almost brings the community to absolute crisis and catastrophe in the early 1980s when Mrs. Thatcher slaps her handbag on the table and demands her money back. No? This is the general accepted belief. So we have, we're starting to form a picture. And the first part of the picture is that this is years, these are years of stagnation and integration. Nothing very much happens, my friend said over there. She's now looking worried. Uh, he no. says it too. He says it too. Yeah, I just reviewed that. <laughs> and we'll pass over his views of, uh, on that in silence. Uh, the um, years of stagnation in the process of in, in integration. Nothing very much happens happens. There's not more integration. Britain joins the European community and yes it brings a desire for more free trade, fair enough, but at the same time it brings with it nationalism, the desire to get their money back, not play by the community rules, to the point that the European community almost collapses. I think most people, if you read the standard textbooks of European integration history that exists nowadays, most people would argue that the nadir of the community's fortunes are 1982-1983 in which Mrs. Thatcher is at her finest. Okay. Now, of course, it's not just Britain. What about France at this time? What was France doing? I can remember this. In order to escape Princess Diana's wedding, I took my bicycle and cycled around France in the summer of 1981 and met lots of young French people of exactly my age, all of whom were convinced that socialism with a human face was now about to arise. No? It was very striking. Of course, France, between 1981 and 1984, is in a period of experiment, trying to construct socialism with a human face. And Mitterrand sees the light. No? He realises that the market's not going to let him do it, big discussion within the Socialist Party, I'm obviously simplifying, and the, uh, the, from, from the middle of 1983 onwards, Mitterrand starts to take a much stronger pro-community line, and this enables France unblocks the community. Again, read the standard accounts, you'll see that this emphasis is there. You, you did that after I went German at the same time, the feeling was just the same. I'm sorry? When you were doing that after I went German at the same time, the feeling was just the same. Yes. When, uh, West Berlin especially, you were in the, you were in the you absolutely swing. Yeah. So, okay, so, what does this lead to? Well, 1985, uh, Jacques Delors is chosen as president of the commission. Enlargement takes place because this is on block two. It's like a magic wand. No? Uh, the 1992 initiative is launched, the uh, completing the single market, the, in, the internal market. Uh, 
Germany, thanks to Helmut Kohl, writes a series of checks making all this possible. European integration is relaunched. No? Relaunched. I, I, I defy anybody here to go and take the standard textbooks in EU studies and look at the historic chapters and, and, and not see the word relaunched. I mean, you can't. I mean, it's there in every single edition. Relaunched obviously implies that before it had sunk into stagnation and was being revived in one way or another. Uh, this, of course, was immensely fortunate. Why? Ilari, you're the expert on this subject. It's your lecture. <laughs> well, it's my lecture, but I mean, Socratic dialogue never does any harm, does it? Why? Why was it so fortunate? What is the role of the EC in the events of the end of the 1980s? Oh, the official role of the yeah no the official role or, or, or the what you read in the textbooks what does it say? Well, actually, you don't find much about the official role of the, the, mm. the end of the Cold War. It's more studies are coming up in the various ones that they don't really find. I don't, is there an official source? That's scientific. Apart from enlargement, I mean, from the council. Okay, that's well, that's maybe scientific literature. That's historians. What does it say? Well, I think most people would tend to agree. <coughs> European integration is crucial for the German for the German unification. Now, I'm not saying the European community was necessarily the major actor, but the European community was vital for the if the European Union and uh, com uh, actually I'm actually quoting Zelikow and Rice here. You know, if the European community hadn't been invented, it would be necessary to invent. They needed something. They needed a pan-European organization. Germany is united under a European roof. No, everybody said that expression. So Mitterrand and Kohl, uh, <coughs> you have the role of the European community uh, in enabling German unification to take place within Western Europe and reducing the fears of the many of the of the many other nations in the European community of the prospect of German integration. No? German, European integration is given a role, is given is assigned the historical I, mean, I agree with this incidentally, I'm not saying that it's wrong, but I'm just trying to draw a picture. In other words, the point to to bring this up, to 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 sum up this picture that we have, what we have is a picture. And I don't think I'm creating a straw man here. Uh, what we have is a picture of a community which in the 1950s was an idealistic venture to bring Europe's countries together, to free markets, to play its part in the transatlantic dialogue, all these things. In the 1970s, in part for uh, economic reasons, the sheer scale of the economic crisis, uh, in part for political reasons, the internal conditions of the different countries forming the EC, uh, a long period of stagnation takes place, in which, as my friend over there said, not much really happens of integration. This, this is compounded by the fact that the one thing that does happen, that there is a, an important an enlargement which leads to Britain entry, is uh, in many ways negative, because the British take an un-European attitude. They bang their handbag on the table and demand their money back. However, in the mid-1980s, there is a real of the European community. It's a relaunch which is led, all you need to do is look at the imagery by uh, President Delors and the Single Market Initiative, which encompasses an expansion of the EU, the EC, to the Mediterranean countries, which um, involves bold policy decisions being taken, such as the um, uh, Delors package, and so forth, 
and this relaunch of the European community is, in, is extremely fortunate because it enables Europe to integrate the, the, the wider Germany which, is, which emerges after the events of 1989. And of course, once Germany is engaged in the European community, once the enlargement to East Germany in effect takes place, one of the conditions that the French ask for for this to take place one of the conditions that the French pose is precisely that the European community takes on a political dimension. And therefore you have, at Maastricht, first of all, that long-term goal, both of the French and of the Italians, of uh, putting the Deutschmark under European control, and you have a political deal. Political union is created. The political dimension of the European community is strengthened, you have common citizenship, you have a strong European Parliament, etc., etc. I'm not going to go into the details of this because you know them all as well as I do or better. The, the, this story is, I think, not a caricature. It's what most people who are doing European Union studies learn. Okay? I, in my opinion, something like that. And obviously, you know, I could be standing here giving you quotations to back all this up, but in my, I'm sure you will take me at my word. This broad outline, like that, in my opinion, is what European Union studies teaches as being the success story of the European Union, of the creation of the European Union. Mm -hmm. It is a success story. Now, I'm not going to argue necessarily that it's, a, it's not a success story, so don't worry, you have not allowed a Eurosceptic into, the, into your ranks. But I am going to sort of try and look at this narrative and see how historians are going to, in my opinion, argue against it, revise it, transform it. This is my point. And it seems to me there are some fairly obvious things which are likely to happen. Here we have a marvellous cartoon. Uh, of the 1984 uh, Fontainebleau uh, summit, and there you are. You see the two great things: uh, Giscard, uh, it's, uh, his, uh, no, sorry, it's Mitterrand, with his uh, passport, European, getting his European passport, and Mrs. Thatcher getting a large check for her rebate. First point. First point that I think historians uh, are going to start taking far more seriously when we study the history of European integration. And that is the role of the European Council. Uh, I see no way around this. Indeed, it's happening already. Um, I, I would argue that in so much of the literature, European Council meetings are treated as a geographical locus for intergovernmental negotiations. No? It's like a kind of what happens off stage from the real events in Brussels. Uh, and that doesn't mean, of course, that in the literature, in this narrative that I'm talking about, that there aren't European councils which uh, are not treated as important. Bremen, 1978, Fontainebleau, 1984, Hanover, 1988, Dublin and Rome in 1990, for heaven's sake. These do obviously get a place in the literature. People do take them extremely serious. Nevertheless, they are regarded as uh, adjuncts to the main business of the European community, I think. Now, somebody might disagree with that, but in my opinion, there's some truth to that. Uh, in, in, in my view, uh, future historians, because you've got to understand, the European Council is formed, founded, 1974, December 1974. Historians haven't got to the European Council yet. This is the first point. Most historians, there are very, very few people working on European integration history, who are working even on the second half of the 1970s, let alone the 1980s. They haven't got to the creation of the European Council yet. And in my opinion, when they do, and they are and will in increasing numbers, they will make a very strong argument to the effect that the European Council was the single most important constitutional innovation in the history of European integration. So my friend over there, you see, something did happen. Uh, the argument I think people would make 
is uh, that De Gaulle was right. That the member states of the European community desperately needed to have a place, an institution, where they could thrash out their, dis their difficulties between themselves and give a strategic direction to their, their common project. Uh, the, uh, in my book, in the introduction to my book, I even wrote, and some of you definitely may disagree with this, but I'll say it anyway, because I think that's the way in which we improve by bouncing off ideas. Uh, I actually think most people see the history of European integration as ultimately being about transferring power, sovereign power, or at any rate, um, de deciding more decisions at supranational level. It's a history of supranationalism. I actually think, if we think about it carefully, one of the things that's really striking about European integration is the fanatical determination of the member states to retain their sovereign powers in the, in the European Council. You know, we went from six to nine to ten to, tw to thirteen, because East Germany is incorporated into to the European community, to, uh, to the expansion in 2004, and now in 2007, and now we have Croatia too. And yet, the nation states have insisted on unanimity on the strategic decisions which are taken by the European community. I think it's one of the enormous facts about European integration, which in my opinion is very often downplayed. The European Council, I think, will be seen. And they, you, actually, this I think it will be seen. You don't need me to say this. Tindermans, no? The famous Tindermans report, one year after the first European Council, basically argues we'll never get anywhere unless we have and a strengthen European Council. We have to base ourselves on this new institution that we've created because only the states acting together in concert will ever be able to make progress towards more European integration. That's what the Tindemans report says. And indeed, in my opinion, you can see that. It's really quite striking when you're looking at the official documentation of the EU. All of a sudden you have this body that's making the big decisions. Uh, I would personally go so far as to say that without the European community, and here we're doing counterfactual history of the most outrageous sort, never mind, without the European community, without the European Council, it's quite, it would have been quite unimaginable for the pre-1974 European Council to survive the crisis of the 1980s. Sometimes the things that don't happen in history are more important than the things that do. And as a result, again and again, Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, the European Council is used as a place where the nation states can find out, can make compromises and carry the process forward, or simply survive, or simply to keep the institutions together. And then, of course, subsequently, uh, you have a period in which the European Council has systematically, and I'm not going to go into the more com contemporary events, but I don't think anybody can reasonably dispute that in terms of decision-making power, the European Council has acquired more and more of a role in the key decision-making processes of the European community over the last, certainly since Maastricht. Rightly so, the Maastricht Treaty says it's one of the key articles. We all tend to concentrate on the creation of the European Central Bank. We all tend to uh, pick up on all kinds of other issues, key article, right at the beginning of the European Council. It is the strategic decision-making body of the European <coughs> community. It is. So this is, I think, something that historians are likely to do far, far more. They're likely to recast the history that I've sketched in terms of the role of the European Council. And here, we get into another fact that I find fascinating. No one would write the history of the British government uh, I, I'm not now taking the, doing something that political scientists will object to. I'm not a political scientist. I don't want to make explicit comparisons. But as an analogy, I would argue that the European Council is the cabinet of the European Union. 
it's the buckle that fastens, and here Walter Badgett does serve the purpose. No? Now, what do we do when we write the national histories of, uh, Euro of Euro European countries, of, of Britain, say? Well, we, we're doing political history. Well, we write about the clashes and the conflicts and the discussions in cabinet, no? We do. Well, where's Crossman for the European Union when we need him? You know, Crossman's diaries, Barbara Castle's diaries, Tony Benn's diaries, they all write their diaries. We have an idea of what happens, especially if we cross-reference reference them all. There is nothing in the EU literature that's similar. And I think it's an enormous pity, but that doesn't mean that that won't continue forever. Uh, Andriotti, you know, apart from lots of papers, <laughs> unfortunately the papers where all the dead bodies, telling you where all the dead bodies are mentioned, Andriotti also has a stenographed uh, account of all the individual European Council members that he was present at. He was present at. Uh, Georges Sonnier, a French scholar, assures me that Mitron has the same. This, I think, will lead, this kind of source will increasingly be used by historians to uh, bring to life the debates that took place within the European Council, and not only within the Council itself, but in the back rooms, <coughs> to give a, a better picture of the back rooms dealing. Now, it, at the moment, this is completely absent. So, <coughs> My first point about how integration, European integration history is likely to be changed, is likely to be enriched, and I think it is an enrichment, as compared to the versions that people get in the European Studies uh, textbooks, I think is a greater centrality on the, the key intergovernmental decision maker of the European community. I would even go so far as to suggest that it may come to be seen as a kind of cabinet of the European community. Now, not literally, I'm not trying to do uh, a, a narrow comparison, but by analogy. That's my, my argument. Now, a second area of revisionism, I think, will be in what you might describe, well, history's instrument, uh, in the area of what you might describe as the intellectual history of the European community. So we've had the institutional history and now the intellectual history of the European community. Uh, I think it, it's at least thinkable that um, the, the, the success narrative surrounding the transformation of the EC into the EU will be seen as being to a remarkable extent self-created and self-constructed. What do I mean by this? Well, in a way, this has already been done already. I don't know how many of you have read Chris Shaw's book on the uh, cultural politics of uh, Jacques Delors, in which he argues, no, Delors was quite consciously making a decision, trying to create a European identity and a sense of uh, European purpose and a sense of the European Union being, in a sense, history's instrument the instrument whereby Europe would be united. Uh, one of the books, of course, uh, I believe Timothy Garton Ash is uh, connected with this, uh, with this uh, uh, institution. I mean, he, of course, has criticized this particular book, uh, you know, A Europe, A History of Its Peoples by Jean-Baptiste Duracell, very, very harshly, and rightly so. This book really gives the commissioned at the end of the 1980s by Jacques Delors really gives the impression you know, that Europe from uh, gone from the caves to the European Union and that this is right and good. There's a concerted effort to try and come up with a common European history which has nevertheless an uplifting message because obviously if we study the real history of Europe it's about individual tribes slaughtering each other. Well, no. Or at least yes until the Schumann plan. And then it changed, and we became one, or we're trying to become one, and this has been the history of the last few years. Now, that's, if you like, the most egregious instance, but this is, there is no doubt at all um, that this was something which was quite consciously being propagated uh, by, the, by the Commission. I think Chris Shaw shows that beyond any argument. And to some extent, 
um, it colours our perception of the importance of EC. Right? In my opinion. Now, I'm now going to talk about something which I really don't understand, but I think it's important. Uh, and I have actually done some empirical work on this. One of the things that's really fascinating about these years is change of gear uh, in perceptions of the European community. Believe me, I have read Italian newspapers, I have read the American press, I have read British newspapers, I have read French newspapers. You get a real shift in public perceptions of the EC from the beginning of 1988 onwards. It's not as if we have a single European Act, Jacques Delors, everything changes and Europe is seen positively. Why should it be? But with the Hanover Summit in June 1988, you do see a shift. It's really quite striking. Uh, and not just in Europe itself. All of a sudden, and it is of a sudden, people who were, the public perception, okay, we're talking of public opinion, but the press perception of the public opinion saying, you know, what newspapers, serious newspapers were saying about the European community, uh, switches from being querulous organisation of nation states that can't get its act together, who will never amount to anything very much, to I'm obviously simplifying, we don't have the time to go into this in total detail. Switches to, well, this is what the New York Times said, July 1988. Having set a deadline for lifting all economic barriers by the end of 1992, the European community has raced ahead in recent weeks to eliminate a large number of obstacles. The community hopes to remove all border posts so that people can drive from Munich to Malaga without stopping at customs. And this is only the beginning. Predictions that an all-powerful European president could emerge and hold his or her own against the United States and the Soviet Union are exaggerated, or at least premature. Still, the implications of the economic integration of the 12 nations are immense. Although the unification plan was established with economics in mind, it will inevitably have vast political repercussions. Individually, the nations of Europe find it hard to be seen as equals by the superpowers. It might be a different story with a united Europe of 320 million people. Right? That same journalist, only a few weeks before, had been saying that this was something going nowhere. Now, okay, that's one document, that's one newspaper story. What does that prove? Well, it's not one document or one newspaper story. It's thousands of newspaper stories. I've got a chart in the paper I've just written for a book that's going to publish Cambridge University Press. And you, if you just look... At the number of mentions of the European community, it bumps along throughout the early 1980s, mid-1988, goes whoosh, straight off the roof. All over the United States, for example, all over the United States, uh, committees of concerned businessmen are formed. Congressional hearings are held. What is this thing called Europe? How is it going to affect our business? On a massive scale, we're talking of dozens of meetings of Congress in which business people, lobbies, are uh, interviewed. Italy too, another country I know well. Exactly the same thing. Sheer chaos. European Union, why can't we have a why, a why isn't the Federalist dream of the fathers ever being realised? At the beginning of 1988. By September, October 1988, Europe is on the march. We're going to have a single currency. We're going to have a single foreign policy. Europe is being created. Now, I, I, I'm not able myself to explain this uh, entirely. But the shift in mood is clear, believe me. Uh, it's very, very striking. Uh, the decisions at Hanover, uh, no, above all the wanted, the decision. Hanover, they, they, they discover that the single market legislation is going very well. They decide to create the Delaw Commission on the single currency and everything. Unquestionably, it's a kind of shift. It's a turning point. Why? I don't know why so much weight should have been given to those decisions, and I say it quite openly, but it's a fact that it is. Uh, now, European Union studies is born in this climate. 
No? Born in the United States in this climate. Neo, ne uh, what's it called? Neo functionalism? All this. You have all of a sudden the spectacle of large industrialized nations doing something that realist or near realist theory just simply doesn't predict. Or so they thought. And again, I mean, if you want to do the work of looking for academic citations of European community, first half of the 1980s, 10 minutes left, right, I'm going to be brief. I said to Anne, I, I will never go over 40 minutes, but I'm afraid I'm somewhat <laughs> loquacious. I, I could carry on talking about this for hours and hours, and I'm sure you're all aware. Uh, and then start looking, you get the enormous growth of an academic industry studying the phenomenon, the strange phenomenon, as it's always called, of, you, of uh, advanced industrialized nations going beyond uh, the, 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 the uh, parameters or the, the framework predicted by, by theory. Okay, third point, right, I'm going to speed up. Uh, so, did both practitioners and academia in short, overinflate the significance of what was happening in 1988-1989. I'm not answering that question with an unequivocal yes, but I do think it's a question that will be asked by historians. People will start to say, why? Why do people make these decisions out to be so important? Now, finally, or nearly finally, I think, too, that when historians come to start writing seriously about the end of the 1980s and the uh, integration, the, the transformation of the EC into the EU, uh, it will be seen, and I don't mean this to sound negative, because it's really not, uh, but far more than it has been so far, it will be seen as a second order development. I do believe this very strongly. Because ultimately, the events that we've been talking about, the Maastricht Treaty, the uh, giving of greater strength to European institutions and so on and so forth, single, single market, these uh, were parasitical, that's the wrong word, I don't want to say, uh, use negative things, <coughs> that's another point I'm trying to make, uh, were in a sense derived from bigger changes that were already taking place. And just some of them are here. I mean, I, uh, it's the end of the experiment in trying to create growth via public spending. No? I mean, you think of the Dutch. I mean, 1970s, early 1980s, a uh, huge program of public spending. Luba's government arrives, 1983. 82, remind me of the date. You have absolute freeze on public spending. Ireland, same thing. Mrs. Thatcher, we all know about. Germany, well, Chancellor Cole comes to power probably precisely because of this point the need to have austerity, more austerity in the public finances. There is a definite shift of, of position. And without that, in other words, there's a shift of economic philosophy from trying to get growth via national policies of public spending, trying to boost growth, to one of trying to get growth via supply-side reforms on a continental scale in order to have economies of scale. European integration required that. What happened in the 1980s was it was necessary to have that. That's the first point. And I think European integration as a consequence will be seen as being subordinate to the decisions taken, the economic philosophy and the decisions taken by national policymakers, in my opinion. Finally, democratization. Uh, if one thinks about it, one of the things I find really interesting, and I can't explain it, is how the expansion of democracy in Europe in the post-war period has been, in some, to some extent, and I'm, again, I don't want to exaggerate this, been almost subordinated to European integration as being a more impact. Yeah. Countries became democratic. They joined the process of European integration because that's what democratic countries did. In some ways, I think it's vice versa. It's the countries joined the, Euro the European Union, but integration existed because countries were becoming democratic. And I think the historical record in the future will show that. I'm nodding over there. I think. I, I, I think this is so true. Once again, incidentally, notice, and it's a point I'm going to make in my final slide, this will require us to do something that we've not been doing enough, and that is concentrate on individual countries as opposed to the global European level. 
Uh, finally. I think the success of the EU, uh, the creation of the Maastricht Treaty, the implementation of the Euro, the enlargement of the 1990s, the engendered a mood which in my book I called EU for it. There was unquestionably uh, particularly post-2002, between 2002-2005, but I think all the way really through the 1990s and early 2000s, a tendency to portray the EU as a new geopolitical colossus, as, I quote Ian Manners, a normative power, as, I quote David Kalea, uh, an institution capable of giving lessons again to the world, as, I quote Mark Leonard, the likely ruler of the 21st century. As, I quote Andrew Moravchik, the global harbinger of future forms of global government. I mean, I could go on. Actually, I will, because I've got one more quotation. As, to quote Jeremy Rifkin, and I know this is uh, Italian, say, Sparare, so we're to Rosso, but it, 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 as the, the body that will, quote, beckon us to a new age of inclusiveness, diversity, quality of life, deep play, don't ask, sustainability, universal human rights, the rights of nature, and peace on earth. Yeah, right. Uh, I don't think one is being a kind of Paolite Eurosceptic if one says, maybe it's not lived up to its billing. Uh, I don't know, non economist nor am I a political scientist, I don't know whether the European Union is going to survive its current crisis. I genuinely don't know. But I don't think at this point, 2012, February 2012, we are able any longer to say something which, for example, in Italy, where I work and teach, is quite common. It's quite impossible to imagine the European Union taking steps backwards. Right? This is just a commonplace. I've heard people give lectures at Italian universities in which they start the European Union is permanent, it will always get stronger. This is not something that can possibly be argued anymore. And I think a lot of people took it for granted, took this almost for granted. As things are, people far better at economics and politics than me think it quite possible that the European Union will decline will stagnate or may even collapse. This is not something that can be ruled out of court. Now, if that happens, if that happens, what will that do to the narrative? Well, it'll do quite a lot, I think. Uh, it will leave historians, and here we are doing pure counterfact, this is just pure speculation, but it's not speculation because it's the way historians work. It will lead historians to go back and try and find out the causes of the crisis, to try and find out why the EU collapsed. It will lead the, uh, historians to go back and look at the Maastricht Treaty and say that the most important thing in the Maastricht Treaty was not necessarily that it created the European Central Bank, but that it didn't create common methods of fiscal government. No? You can see the point. This is what historians do. They go back and they try to, uh, certainly general historians, they go back and they try to attribute significance to facts, and facts change. Facts all come with points of view. And here I think we have, uh, 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 and, and certainly the, there is the possibility, if the EC fails, or if the EC has a major crisis, of systematic rewriting, taking place. Things that we think are currently important might be downplayed. Things that have been neglected in the current story might be up, up, uh, upgraded. Uh, different weights, different spaces are given. This is, in fact, what historians do when we do historical revisionism. You know, in a way, everything I've been saying in this lesson is a gigantic truism. 
No. Historians revise. It's a constant process. History is a constant process of revision. It is. But what does that mean? No. What does a constant process of revision mean? Well, revisionism is systematic thinking about the historical significance of events. With hindsight, yeah. And one thing that really has struck me, writing a general history, to quote Herbert Butterfield, a compressed version of the whole, is how you have to be ruthless in your choices. You have to be. You can't write about everything that took place in the European community for one day, let alone for 70 years, 60 years. Uh, therefore, you as the historians say, you as the general historians say, this was important, therefore it deserves space and emphasis. This was not, therefore it should have less or none. How many, let me ask you a question, how many theses and articles were written on the EU Constitution in 2004, not so long ago? Well, if you go on Google Scholar, you will find out that the answer is thousands. No? My book, it gets three quarters of the page. So, concluding. What I've done in this paper, then, is try to give my best guesses about how the historiography of European integration will address and redress the transformation of the EC into the EU. And I think if I'm even approximately right, we'll see the supranationalist success story, which I believe is the dominant narrative surrounding EU studies today. It, we'll see it, sorry, I've got to be Italian here, ridimensionata, how do you say that? We'll see this, huh? Yes. We'll see it in some ways altered. Uh, and we'll see European integration as being one strand in the pattern of contemporary European history rather than as being the dominant motif. We'll see European integration being eclipsed to some extent, I think again, by studies of individual nations as we try to make sense. Let, let me just I'm sorry, I'm completely going over my time limit here. But let's look again <laughs> at why we don't study some individual countries. Here we have a situation where um, Italy and Greece are bringing down the European community, arguably. Oh, Italy and Greece, they have historical problems. Well, perhaps people should study them. When I started studying it, Italy, I assure you there were dozens, literally dozens of people from across, the Europe, from across the European community, across the United States, studying contemporary Italian politics. Now it's a handful of people who do it. Why? Because we're all studying the EC. Maybe we should focus back on some of the individual nations. However, if we do all these things, perhaps we won't be any bad. Thank you. Thank you very much.